Uh, I know you're going to enjoy this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Peter Cochran. Uh, all, I, all I did was get out of bed and come to work and do kind of interesting stuff every day. Um, I didn't set out uh, to uh, do anything really specific. I've never had a work plan. I've never had an agenda. Um, I've just been sort of uh, engaged in things that struck me as being kind of interesting. So there's a, an interesting line over here that grabbed my eye. And that was, uh, if you have an idea, and uh, I have an idea, we have two ideas, and um, I think there's several observations this morning. You're all here, you're all standing. Uh, like you, I, I run my own business. Um, it's difficult. Um, I have never seen anything like this environment. Uh, it's really, really tough. I have a formula for you this morning. It's uh, twice as much energy to get an order that's half as good as it used to be. Uh, f five years ago, um, and um, it, it's just really interesting why we're in the situation that we're in. And so I'm going to give you a different kind of perspective. Um, it's going to be technology-based, and uh, it's intended to be... Two minutes and I've broken the microphone. Just a second, let me fix this. It's intended to be one, uh, a roller coaster, uh, and two, a bit of a salad of a presentation with, with all kinds of topics. I looked at the delegate list. We've got people from all sectors. So I can guarantee there's something here for all of you, uh, and there's something that I hope is going to um, act as a catalyst in the way you think. Uh, if you and not looking at the world in a different way when I finished with you, then I have failed. Uh, there are not too many of those. Um, if there is something that really grips you and you can't wait, wave at me. I will uh, take a question mid-span and, and we'll, we'll make this interactive. So let's, let's get into this and we'll start here. Um, there are lots of people when they do presentations talk about stuff um, that is hypothetical. There is nothing that I'm going to show you that I've not had my sticky little fingers on and played with. Uh, and some of it is stunning. Let me give you an idea of my life. Uh, uh, last year, I had several interesting experiences. One, I stood on the top of a nuclear reactor. Uh, I was dragged across the floor holding onto a chain by a supermagnet uh, three meters away. And I couldn't stop it. So strong was the force. And I picked up an atom and moved it from one place to another. And I never thought in my life I would see an atom, let alone pick one up and move it. And what have I done this year? I watched with two rats in two different boxes, with 100 wires into the brain of one rat, wired over to the brain of another rat. Food was put into a corner of a box. The rat went for the food. And the rat in the box with no food went to the same corner. It was one of those, what the Americans would call, excuse the profanity, holy shit moments. It was just, whoa, you know, what are we doing here? Where is this going? So those are the kinds of things that I see. And so I, I'm going to make some business observations. And I've never seen so many stressed people. I've never seen so many tired people. I've never seen so many people struggling. And I want to address the question, why? Um, and uh, WTF, by the way, stands for why things fail. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, how come? Um, the technology is accelerating. I'm a technologist. I struggle. I buy my technology like you by the color of the knobs. I don't look down at the specification of stuff. I'll come to somebody at a meeting like this and say, is that phone you've got good? Do you like it? What's good about it? Then I go and buy one. But the key thing is, if I don't like it, I ditch it. I'm a technologist. I don't give a fig what's in the box. I don't care how it works. As a business guy, I want to know what is it going to do for me? What's the return on investment? If it doesn't help me, I don't want it. We are getting increasing levels of complexity. It's stunning how complex our world has become and how much we do not understand. There's another factor. We have been driven to optimize things, to right-size, 
focus, hone things up, increase profitability. Return on, on investment is kind of key, but it's all become very short term. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in a big way. We should not optimize anything. Optimization kills you. Mother Nature survives in the whole because her organisms are inefficient. We are inefficient. Society is inefficient. That's what makes it resilient. Let me give you a good example. Buy a Mercedes E-Class. It will run for years without even going to the garage. Get an F1 racing car, which is optimized to hell, and it's going to operate now and again. So there's a very interesting balance. How far should we optimize things? And what it actually does is drives companies out of business. And there is a very long list of big names that have gone bust. Kodak, Hewlett Packard, who are about on their last legs, are, are good examples of companies that were big, great, and optimized, focused on a narrower and narrower product set, made them better and better and better, but didn't go with innovation and long-term activities like R&D on new stuff. This is a sort of seismic response to what happens in markets. Uh, it's not the sort of thing we cope with very well. Everything's operating smoothly, and all of a sudden there is a blip. And the blip is catastrophic, and it hurts. Brittle systems are not good news. The other reason is we've got some really outdated management practices. Uh, if you're running an operation that's manufacturing concrete and you know everything there is to know about concrete, hierarchy is wonderful. You do not need innovation on a production line uh, when you know what's to be done with great precision. But if you are running an innovative shop, Hierarchy kills it, absolutely kills it. You need the ability to have some anarchy. Otherwise, nothing changes. And one of the most upsetting things I get is some giant corporation calls me and they say, Dr. Cochran, we're setting up an innov innovation program. My heart sinks. I've now got to explain to them why they're not going to have a process for innovation. There is no process for innovation. You cannot write down a formula for finding a girlfriend, getting married, and having children. There is no such formula. It, it's, a, it's a very interesting how people don't get that you can't actually put process around everything in life. You cannot. Now, this is a kind of interesting quote, and to me, this is how it kind of feels, running very fast. And at the end of the day, you find yourself actually with more email than you started with at the beginning of the day, or more problems. Uh, and very often, uh, you find yourself in business these days with nobody to hand off to. You're it. The book stops here. You've got to be able to fix things. And it's more now about changing the business model than it is about worrying about the technology. But what I can tell you is this situation that we have now is the new norm. It's not going to go back to the way it was. The ratchet of technology and change has gone click. It never goes backwards. And there is no ideal. There's no place you can go back in time where you could say, life was better then. It was better when, no, it wasn't better then. It was terrible. You only have to go to a vintage car rally to realize why you drive a modern car. <laughs> Jesus. You know, how many people here can remember the choke? All the young people are going, the what? The first car I had was a, had a starting handle. It was 30 brake horsepower, and if it kicked back, it broke your arm. I wouldn't like to try and crank my car now. It's got 350 brake horsepower. I'd finish back in Glasgow if it kicked back. I mean, it's absurd. You get in the car and you turn the key. If you go back 30 or 40 years, if somebody said, can I borrow your car, you would be joking. Now if you say, somebody says, can I borrow your car, where do, where do you want to go? And the reason is, it works all the time, it's reliable, and the worst thing that can happen is somebody's going to scratch it. It's no longer technology. This is no longer technology. You can borrow this. It works, it's reliable, it's got an interface we all understand. However, this is still technology, it's still a little bit troublesome. Um, 
and, and you, you, you sort of, things that don't quite work properly at the technology. So let's just put some context around all of this and let's have a look at uh, some of the interesting stuff that have created this new form of chaotic stability. The other aspect to, to all of this is our education system, which was created to satisfy an industrial revolution that has gone, that is now totally and utterly unfit for purpose. Uh, before the Reformation, people would study things. They'd study everything. It was possible to be a zoologist and an artist and an engineer all at the same time. And then we put these stovepipes in and said, all right, we'll have biology over here and we'll have mathematics over there and we'll have art over here, design, uh, psychology. And we split it all up. And not surprisingly, it goes badly wrong. And it goes badly wrong because we've now got global problems in, in the big sense, the macro sense, but we've got global problems in the micro sense as well. And we need lots of different capabilities. So I have my eye all the time on a big problem, and it's called sustainability. I cannot find a single sustainability program that actually works. Not wind farms, not solar cells, not recycling. None of it works. And the reason is, the people who have gone for these schemes never studied thermodynamics, and they don't understand thermodynamics. And if they did, they wouldn't do such dumb things. And what they do is they look at the end point. They don't look from the beginning to the end of the process and say, what is the total cost? I have a 30-second tutorial on uh, thermodynamics, if you would like it. It's a kind of fun thing. You know, engineers and scientists and mathematicians are terrible at explaining things. So see if you can get your brains around this. OK. Thermodynamics in 30 seconds. There's a game. We're all in the game. The bad news is we all have to stay in the game. We can't opt out. There is some bad news. Bad news, really bad news is we can't actually win the game, but we can break even. That's the good news. We can break even. But we can only break even on a cold day. The snag is it never gets that cold. That's the whole, that's the whole thermodynamic thing. It doesn't matter if you sit still, you're using energy, you're wasting resources, you're doing damage. No matter what you do, it doesn't improve the situation, it makes it worse. So we're actually in a damage minimalization, and I'm going to show you something that I think will fix ultimately the problem. And it's not without hope, but it means an entirely different mindset. So this is not about recycling bottle tops and plastic and not having landfill. It's not about changing light bulbs or using wind farms. It's much more complex than that. We've got to stop, first of all, doing a lot of the stuff that we do. And uh, we've got to start using technologies. So if we're going to get real broadband, uh, we can do video conferencing and stuff. Uh, and we could do a lot of things that we've been able to do for the last 50 years but have not chosen to. And I want to show you uh, quite a remarkable video of uh, some pop concert. And I'm just going to let it run for a moment, and then I'm going to tell you what the, the message is here. So let's have a, a look at the pop concert. Isn't that cool? Uh, if you want to look at advanced technology in the multimedia sense, you have to go and look at pornography. Those guys are always in the lead. Uh, they're always exploiting the very best technology. Then comes the, 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 the events industry. And what these guys are now doing is taking artists that are dead and putting them on stage with live performers as holographic entities. And, and these were the Black Eyed Peas, and those two performers are actually alive. But there are now several concerts that have been run, and you have to think now, and having John Lennon come up on stage, do a concert, and then just dissolve and go away. 
Now think of the implications for education. Imagine if you could recreate Aristotle or Einstein or Richard Feynman and have them talk to you and it feel real. We've been able to do that for quite some time, but we've chosen not to. Um, and, and that's a direction the technology is going. It's a capability. Um, I got fiber to the home cheaper than copper in 1986. We still don't have it in this country. I got a gigabit to the home both ways, cheaper than copper in 1990, and we still don't have it in this country. One gigabit to the home is just being deployed uh, right now on the island of Jersey, and that's the only piece of the UK that's got uh, 1,000 megabits either way, both ways to the home. Kind of interesting. It's taken all of that time. So it's not unusual for innovation to take a long, long time. So what I can tell you is what the technology is going to do. What I can't tell you is what are the human race going to do. So let's see what we've got to do to achieve sustainability. Here is the key. The future for us is at this interesting cusp of nano, bio, IT, and artificial intelligence. Mother Nature started with atoms, created molecules, and came up and created uh, organics and non-organic materials. And we popped out of that system, and we've come down with organic and non-organic material and created smaller and smaller things. We've gone up into space, but I can now tell you that the smallest transistors that we are now using in our mobile devices are about a third of the size of a flu virus. So the two have overtaken each other. So Mother Nature's come up from below with a bio biology, and we've come top down with our nanotech, and now I can't tell the difference between the two. So why is this kind of important? It's important because we can now get away from the bulk fabrication of things by machining, by smelting. We can now manufacture by printing working entities like spanners and gearboxes and complex things without having to waste shed loads of energy and shed loads of material and have recycling. We're now heading towards a world where we can reform materials that are very, very complex and we're actually now getting to the point where we can program materials. Uh, just a few months ago, I saw an injection, an injection molded uh, disc for the human spine. Manufactured uh, with and, and equally as good as the real thing, but not, not yet implanted in people because it's not an approved uh, piece of technology. Uh, last year, the first bicycle and the first automobile were printed. The snag is the automobile is phenomenally expensive because we've been bashing out tin uh, for a couple of hundred years and we know how to do it real cheap. And the question is, how do we get to the point where we can make an automobile where the, the body, the plastic, is the battery, uh, where the body can be programmed for, sh for shape and for color and to self-repair? And for anybody that doubts this technology is going to uh, have an impact, here is a jawbone that was implanted into a lady at 83 years old who had lost uh, this lower mandible. And uh, uh, she can now uh, talk and, and eat. Uh, with confidence. Life-changing stuff. But let's just have a look at some of the other stuff. And there's an interesting crossover in the area of nano and bio. Um, we're doing things um, with stem cells that we don't fully understand. So as an engineer, my line goes like this. We were killing each other very well with bows and arrows, slingshots and guns long before we understood ballistics. So we're now repairing human beings with technologies and with stem cell growth of entities long before we actually understand what is happening. Just because we don't understand something doesn't mean to say that we can't use it. So here's something quite graphic, uh, an ear on a mouse which shocked a lot of people, uh, but that man needs an ear and it's been grown on his arm and it will be transplanted from his arm to his head and he won't reject it. Uh, to me, this is magical. The most stunning thing I've seen uh, is, um, in this regard, is a, a young man from the war zone uh, with about an inch and a half uh, arm, uh, sorry, an inch and a half of material taken out of his arm due to a burn. 
So he's got a big cavity in his arm. Um, you have to now think of him putting his arm onto a flatbed printer, and I mean a Hewlett Packard printer, the kind of which you, you might have in your office. Uh, the heads no longer have uh, ink in them. Uh, they have stem cells. The stem cells are sprayed into the cavity in reverse uh, polarization, if you like, to, to the hole. They fill the cavity. And what grows back is actually functional tissue. Uh, and the only snag with it, it looks pretty grim. It looks keloid. It looks grossly keloid because we don't quite understand how to make it form muscle and then subcutaneous fat and then the skin. But only by pushing will we get there and find these uh, sort of techniques. What staggers me is the amount of energy that we put into killing each other and what good comes out of it in the end. So by trying to find more and more efficient ways of killing each other, we then spend even more money, if you like, uh, than we normally would, trying to find solutions to the damage that is done to human beings. This is something that's going to impact on you and I real quick. This is a sensor. It's a nanotube sensor. It's microfluidics. It can detect a single molecule of a substance. It's far more sensitive than any animal's nose. So if we went back to medieval times, your doctor would have looked at you, he would have felt you, he would have smelt you, and then he would have tasted you. And that was the biological testing of the day. Today you go to the doctors, they take a swab, it goes off to a lab for a week or two, and then you get the result. During that week or two, you get worse. With this technology, they'll be able to do a test, give an instant diagnosis. And how fast is this advancing? Here are the first two prototype printer size genome analysis boxes. How about a situation where 15 years, $30 million to decode a genome is now half a day, $600, and the target is 10 minutes, $10. These are 10 minute, $10 prototype boxes. That changes your relationship with the doctor, and it changed changes the relationship with the medical profession if you choose to go to Boots and buy your own. And that's what we're talking about. So this kind of technology, these sensors, these kinds of machines uh, are on a scale of uh, pregnancy testing kits. Now, when will it happen? We may have to wait for the present generation of the medical profession to die <laughs> before this lot comes in. And very often, that's what it takes. You have to wait for people to die uh, before you can actually get change. So here we are. We can manipulate atoms. We can uh, manipulate living tissue. We can do things that we've never been able to do before. And that is where I think we're going to see uh, our sustainable future come from. So here's something now. Um, you've all probably seen Gary Kasparov when he lost to Deep Blue at chess and everybody got so upset. This walker at the top uh, is designed by NASA, but not by a human being, by an artificial intelligence machine it was given the job and it came up with that design. And human engineers are now trying to build that beast uh, and make it. This at the bottom is sugar cube uh, robots. They're a, bit, a lot smaller than that. But what, what people are now doing is saying, we don't understand how molecular stuff works, so we will build it. You know, the ultimate arrogance of uh, the engineers. I, I always like you know, the difference in the professions. The, um, the philosophers will look at a chicken and say, uh, you know, let's see if we can think how a chicken works. The physicist will come along with a baseball bat and kill it and pull it to pieces and say, let's have a look inside and see how it works. And the engineers in their arrogance will come along and say, we will build you a better chicken. Of course, the marketeers come along and say, who needs a chicken? So it's a sort of, it's a sort of interesting approach, the way, the way we, we look at stuff. Now, this is a little bit of Hollywood and a little bit of reality. It's, in, it's Intel, so it's serious, but it's not 100% what it seems. This doesn't quite work yet, but it's uh, mutating matter. This is molecular clay. 
This is stuff that you and I could get hold of and could shape like Play-Doh, only it's molecules, it's, it's real plastic stuff. And, and it's, it's all the, the things that you sort of dream of. It's the kind of thing that you see in uh, uh, the Batman movies where he's got programmable materials that will be floppy and will be solid depending on how, uh, what metal charge is put on. But this is not quite real. Uh, but this is where the innovation starts. This is the dream. And uh, it, it's a sort of prospect that I think we have to contemplate. So here we are. Open software, networks, access, hardware. Hardware is going to be the next big deal. We're going to stop shipping goods and we're going to start shipping designs. You can make a design for something and I'll buy it off you and I'll manufacture it locally. Uh, it's going to change the way we think, and it, open innovation is a part of it. So I want to get a message over to you, and it's, we no longer have the facility of people working in a shop on their own, doing their own thing, being highly creative and solving the problems of the world. It does not happen. Steve Jobs was a great frontman for an organization that's absolutely enormous, with thousands of creative people working in teams trying to please him. So open innovation is the new model. And the question is, how the heck do we do it? Very often, I get great innovators. And I've got four of them. And the problem is, I have to get a room big enough to get all their egos in. It's really tough. It's never the technology. It's always the people. It's really difficult to get people to come together to work and to actually recognize that they've got to make a contribution, and they might not be kingpin. And in my past, the way I've broken it down is that I've never had teams of all mathematicians or all free, uh, physicists or all chemists because prima donnas emerge. So I've broken down the teams. I've had a mathematician, a theologian, a social scientist, a designer, an electrical engineer, electronics engineer, mechanical engineer, biochemist. Now nobody can be top dog. Everybody has got to contribute. And then you need that sense of creative tension, that competition, to make them gel together and to work. The really good news, here is the core of the planet. Here are the 1,318 transnational corporations that fuel everything. They're already very connected, but guess what? There are millions and millions of SMEs that support that huge network of big producers. You think of Companies like Toyota and Mercedes, uh, Sony and Apple as being the manufacturers of things. No, they're the integrator of things. They buy all their bits, they get all their designs, they get all their big innovation from lots of little guys, bring it together, and they are the systems integrators. So Boeing aircraft don't manufacture aircraft any more than Ford manufacture cars. Boeing aircraft buy their bits from all over the place. The key thing that they've got are the jigs and fixtures that allow you to glue them together and the design knowledge and the expertise of making it all work together and they orchestrate things. And we need, as small companies, to be a part of that game. Even better, there are billions and billions of creative human beings on this planet that can play the game. So here are some of the things that happen now where you can bring in workers incredibly cheap from all over the world to work for you. You can get problems solved, but you can also go in the opposite direction. People want to buy your skills and your capabilities. And the question is, how do you get at them? How do you access this demand? And it really is about networking. And when you actually draw a map of the whole of the space of crowdsourcing, it is just vast. So the rest of the day, Gary's going to fix that for you is going to show you the ways of getting in to this. But key to it is an open mind, an innovative mind, and a mind that says, I am willing to do, quote, almost anything to win here. This is an incredible learning opportunity. And also key to it is cloud. Cloud is not some kind of fun game and some kind of distraction. The cloud is key. This is Henry Ford gets into computing. Why are people and organizations faffing around 
with server farms and providing email things and stuff and telling people in organizations, no, you can only have 100 megabytes for your email account when Google give me two gigabytes for free. What a weird, weird world. Choose the right devices, choose the right supplier, get into the right networks, know the right people, share everything that you can. My presentations are all free. When I finish this, you can download all my slide set for free. Uh, movies, sound files, papers, everything. Give it all away. Create an environment where people can actually feed off each other and then we'll see where it goes. We'll see where it leads. We'll see how much GDP we can generate. I, I, I don't think so, uh, and, and the reason is that uh, we are going to become the machines. Well, that's what I mean. uh, it's already happening. Um, let's just do a little heel tap. Does anybody want to hone up to a respiratory stimulator or a pacemaker or a, a hearing aid implant inside the head? Uh, people don't usually want to hone up that they're uh, sort of cyborgish. Um, <laughs> but but some, of my, some of my friends have got top side of eight implants that go from various joints that have been replaced uh, through to pacemakers, uh, respiratory stimulators. I, I'm going deaf, and I, I, it's something I inherited from my mother, and um, I, I get by real well in a quiet environment. When it gets noisy, it gets get difficult, and my wife keeps getting onto me, you need an earring aid, and I don't want a big nog of plastic in my ear. I want it on the inside, but if I'm gonna have surgery, and, uh, and I'm gonna have uh, an electronic uh, earring aid on the inside, then God damn it, I want a DAB radio, I want FM radio, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, I want my mobile phone, and I want everything else in there as well. You know, I mean, let's just not hang around here. You know? But yes, uh, it's, it's, an in, it's an interesting um, uh, discussion. Um, that is an entirely uh, different uh, presentation. If you go, if you go onto uh, the internet, search TEDx, TEDx Brussels 2011, you'll find a 10 minute presentation by me on a mathematical formula that describes what um, intelligence actually is. Okay, and here in, is the uh, 20 second knockdown version. Um, you can have intelligence without a brain. But you can't have intelligence without sensors, eyes, ears, some awareness of the world, and some actuators. So uh, if you take people, and this has been done, that have been comatose for a decade, uh, cabbage state, just vegetative, and they're lying there, and you slide them into an MRI scanner and whisper in their ear, I want you to think about playing tennis, their brains will light up in 60% of the cases as if it was you or I. Um, here is the big problem. Um, there are over 120 definitions of intelligence in the literature. Uh, all come out of philosophers. Not one of them is worth a light. Uh, here are some words. Life, uh, life intelligence, complexity, scalability, value, all of those words we use all the time and we have no way of describing what we mean. And if I say to you, tell me what you think intelligence is and I go around the room, I'll get thousands of different answers. So what I've sought to do is to put a framework around defining what intelligence is. And what I've been able to do is design comparative intelligence. And what happened next was really cool. I got a ping from the University of California, San Diego, by a bunch of biologists who had applied this formula to uh, things like microbes. And um, the, the start of this message was, you have confirmed something I've suspected for a long time. Microbial life is intelligent. Well, I think it is. But when you talk to the philosophers, they will start to talk about self-awareness. But if I watch biological life under a microscope, I see self-awareness. I see things that react to each other. But if you, know, if you get into the, uh, the discussions with the, with the philosophers, um, therein lies the dark side of the force. 
and, yes, and uh, you know, you are, you are going to be engulfed in conversations of meaningfulness. Uh, I don't think so. It's going to be meaningless and you're not going anywhere. And, and engineers don't do that. Um, if I can't build it, I, I've got a real problem. Um, so th that's um, where, where it goes. So uh, let's just bring this right down to what's this going to do to me next week. Um, uh, Nick, uh, Mike, Machiavelli didn't say this, I did. Um, but if Machiavelli was alive, he would have said it before I thought it. Um, it it's really uh, uh, quite difficult because uh, this is what you very often find that you're flying. Uh, and then mid-Atlantic at 35,000 feet, you decide that before you get to New York, you've got, you've got to change it to one of these. So you, you've got to get out there, you've got to get rid of... Uh, three engines, you've got to get rid of 90% of the fuselage, you've got to get rid of uh, 299 seats, you've got to get rid of all the crew, uh, and it's just going to be painful. It's actually easier to build a new company th than to modify an old one. And incrementalism is a killer. Uh, this, believe it or not, was a serious proposition by the card companies. They've got to be kidding. But we do know that giant leaps go badly wrong. They, they're risky and, 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 and they hurt, but some companies get it right. And the question is, how the heck do they do it? And I think it's by really understanding stuff. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs never had a marketing campaign. He never did uh, user surveys or talk to any users at all. Uh, they just put stuff on the table. It didn't all work. It wasn't all right. But when they got it right, they got it really, really right. And satisfy markets, you know, make it easy, make it simple, make it obvious, make it convenient. Um, satisfy a problem, just deliver value to people. And, and now the scope is huge. I had a great experience the other day. I, I travel a lot and I was going through uh, Gatwick Airport and there was this family uh, behind us. You know, with, and uh, there was uh, all this stuff coming through, you know, our families. Uh, there's all these cases, and the parents have got a Tesco bag, and the kids have got all these cases. And there's this little, uh, all this stuff came through, and there's this bright pink iPad. And, and I was waiting for the mother to go and fix it up. Oh, no, this little four-year-old came up, picked it up, and put it in a pink satchel, put it on her back, and off she went. It was just really cool. And you sit, you sit in the airport lounge, and there's a whole family, and, and the mother's sort of running around getting drinks and stuff, and the father's on his on his mobile phone texting and the kids are playing games and the eldest kid's on an iPad and they're all engaged on stuff. So it's now interesting. Uh, I saw a little uh, child, two and a half years old, go up to the TV screen and went like this. <laughs> it's like, geez, you know, I can understand the frustration because I now, I now find myself, I'm oscillating between touch screens and not, and I start hitting my laptop screen. It's like, no, wrong interface really sort of quick. The thing we know is that timing's got to be right, and, and it, it's just really difficult to get some of us spot on. So here we are. This is what it's about. All these things coming together, and that's where the big opportunities are. That's the space that we've got to address. I'm intrigued. There is technology, uh, and I did a lot on this 30 years ago, has gone live, and this county has probably got more of this tagging technology than probably anybody else, and it's on cows. So all the modern dairies have got all the cows tagged. And we're now just looking at a, a tagging program for dogs and other animals, and I will be the first in the country to be tagged to get rid of my damn passport, to have to wait in line for all these stupid human beings who have got to look at my photograph as if I was going through some medieval gateway where I have to be identified by a damn picture that's definitely of somebody else because it's not me in that photograph, but they think it is. So I, I, I just want to uh, get away from uh, the things that slow me down and, and do that kind of stuff. So I did some work for the card companies, and this is a, a good example. Um, I walk around with two sets of cards. This is the minimal, absolutely drop-dead set that I must have, and there's another set with all the airlines and all the loyalty programs and all that stuff. It's about 10 times bigger than this. Drives me nuts. And the card th companies think that we're going to go from this to that. 
And they see that as a big program. You know, we're, we're going to go from swipe to wave. Oh, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, that's not the problem. This is the damn problem. I, I sit down, my cards hurt me. I put my jacket on, my cards hurt me. I got so many cards. I go for a coffee, I get another card. I, I, I don't want another card. Don't you want one of our loyalty cards? No. How are we going to do this? Go to Korea, open a bank account. If you want a credit card, plastic, it means you're leaving the country. Because all your cards and all your banking is on here. This is your credit card, period. And they look at our world as if it was weird. They don't have locks. You put your thumb on the door, the door opens. And it's all Mickey Mouse, $10 technology. But the Western world, in its inimitable way, carries on using clunky technology. It makes us delightfully inefficient. Let me tell you a little story, because I'm sometimes employed in wargaming, and the reason is there's a, an evil side to my brain. Um, you wouldn't want me as an enemy. So here's a true story. Um, I was called in right at the beginning of the, the, the whole debate of uh, medical records, and I sat in an NHS hospital where this debate was, was happening, and this issue came up. So I sort of took it on the chin for a few minutes, and I got up and walked out, and I went down to the restaurant, and sure enough, outside the restaurant was a cart full of medical records, which I nicked. And I wheeled them back through the hospital, took them into the room and said, here's your security. 22% of all medical records are lost at any one time, which means we can't find them. They're in transit. They're somewhere. And then, you know, so QED. So I then walked all the way back, uh, put the records back. The guy was still having his lunch. Um, a few weeks later, I was in the hospital and... Uh, I was sat in a chair, and a nurse put down a pile of records and went away. And I just opened them up and flicked through them, took a few photographs and put them back. Yeah, of course I could. Yeah, it's kind of a neat thing to do. Uh, there's your, your security. So all fallacious arguments. And the trouble is, we have largely a uh, technologically illiterate society. That is the big problem. And it's driven by a media that are quite scurrilous who pronounce, make all these pronouncements, and you get people worried to death. I have people coming to me saying, I'm not having Wi-Fi in my home, it will cook your brain. You know, I say, all right, well, try it on a chicken, you know, I mean. Uh, <laughs> if you want to have fun, or you want to go blind real quick, put your microwave oven on and stand that close to the door, and you'll get cataracts real quick. You know, so you've got a, a kilowatt at one end and half a watt, it's just ridiculous. Let me, let me ask you a question. Is your bank account a real problem? Do you know where your banking bits are? Have you any idea where your banking bits are? Do you, do you worry about your banking bits? <laughs> you probably do now, yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the answer is, one, there is no such thing as security. Nothing is ever 100% secure. There is always a risk. And the risk is always in the direction you're not looking. Okay, so that's the reality. Um, ask yourself the question, um, how much money have you personally lost in the banking system? And what would happen if money falls out of your pocket? Uh, what people do is they focus on an unreal risk. In the, in the medical records bit, the absurd discussion was, we must have 100% security with electronic records. Why? We never had 100% security with paper records. Quite the reverse. It was so poor, it was laughable. Well, and, and what you can do is have reasonable levels of security. But uh, you need a lot of expertise uh, to break into banks. My view is I would actually uh, choose to choose Google's security over my bank's security. Um, the dollar, the pound, the euro are too crude a measure on which to make any decision. We are destroying the planet, perhaps. We have no idea, perhaps, uh, because of the crudity of our economic system. Uh, the, none of the economic models have ever worked, and I can't see them ever working, because we need to take into account at least another two parameters. 
Uh, one is the impact of any decision we make on the ecology, and, and three, the impact on society and people of that decision. So to, to optimize continually on the basis of the dollar, the euro, the pound, just gets us into a whole lot of trouble. And so we need to look at the implications. The, the, the little uh, solution to this problem is uh, human nature. Uh, we are actually a driven species. We can't help being competitive. We want to win. We want to change things. Um, I look at it like this. There are actually far more good neurons on the planet than bad ones by a long, long way. The snag is you don't need many bad ones to cause absolute mayhem. And, and it's up to the good guys to keep control of the bad. Uh, and that's the best we can do. And it's part of the inefficiency of the system. I must be running out of time. So let, let me, and by the way, I'm going to be here beyond, to be on lunch. And then I should be disappearing about 2 o'clock. And I'm quite happy to be nailed by anybody between then and now. And um, I'm quite happy to be uh, pursued afterwards. So you will have my contact details. And you better go on my website. And I'm very happy to continue these kinds of discussions. Um, and uh, it, it's sort of... None, none of this easy, but let me, let me reassure you, engineers, scientists, people, don't get up in the morning and think, Jesus, I had a bad day yesterday, I'll see if I can have an even worse one today. I mean, we really don't. We get up in the morning and we say, you know, yesterday wasn't so good, how can I make it better? Oh, and by the way, I'm going to die very shortly, and what kind of a mess am I going to leave behind? I've got, I got kids, I've got grandkids. I don't want to hand them a baton that's got you know, a sticky end. I want them to have a baton where there are solutions, where we've sorted out some problems. And this is a way of looking at the situation. We could not have got to where we are today with the levels of health care, of fitness, of wealth, of well-being, without the Industrial Revolution and the bloody mayhem and torment and mess that went with it. The question is, we have to ask on the bigger scale is, where do we want to get to? And where we actually have to get to, in my mind, goes like this. We have got to stop manufacturing and producing and delivering more and more to the few and start creating sufficient for the many. Because that is the only way that we're going to get peace on this planet where we have an equitable lifestyle right across all societies and all of mankind. That's where we've got to get to. For sure, the industrial and the models that we've got right now are not going to do it. And that's why going down this route of uh, new materials is more likely to get us there, but we have to do real thinking. The things that really wouldn't worry me are the professionalization of teaching, education, training and uh, politics. We now have people who go to school, go to university and become a teacher. There is no value add. We now have people that go to school, go to university and become a politician. There is no value add. They have no experience in any other domain than the one they've been trained in. That is, to my mind, highly dangerous. We need people with a lot broader experience if they're going to make good value judgments and where we're actually going to get to is the machines are going to have to run the politics because human beings can't. And that would be a great benefit. Okay, so let me, let me just uh, scoot right to the end here. Uh, it's been great fun with you this morning. And uh, I'm just going to uh, come down here. Let me get right down to the, uh, the end slide. Damn it. Here we go. And put that up for you, and then you can just copy that down. Okay, so if you go on cochrane.org.uk, um, that's my home page, you'll find my contact details. If you go to presentations, you'll find lots of presentations with this stuff in. And some of them are quite specialised. They deal with, with topics like, what is intelligence? You know, help yourself. And if you can't find what you're looking for, email me. And, and I'll either send you the, point you to the right one or I'll send you some stuff. Uh, there, are, there are over a thousand uh, scientific articles, papers and blogs that have accumulated uh, over the last 25 years. The, uh, the, the prior uh, 15 years of my professional life uh, were unfortunately before the time of computing. I've been around a, time, a while. 
And so uh, that stuff is on paper and it's not been scanned in, but it's probably irrelevant anyway. Okay, it's, it's, it, it's sort of gone. But it, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, just help yourself. And, and I, I have... I, uh, just a few weeks ago, I had a really interesting experience. I was called in by a firm of patent attorneys uh, to give a presentation of 20 minutes all night. And the lady who got up before me was a patent attorney. And she got up and said, when I was getting my presentation ready, uh, you know, she deals with intellectual property, this lady. She, she's focused on intellectual property. She says, I, I couldn't find any nice pictures, so I stole these off Peter Cochran's presentation, <laughs> which I thought was cool. So I was the next person up, and I got up, and I said, you know, well, lots of people, I think, had their materials stole, stolen, would have been very upset. But I, I don't mind. And the reason is, I stole it from someone else. And <laughs> it's, 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 so that makes it cool. So my, my words of wisdom are, you know, um, if you steal one person's results, it's plagiarism. But if you were to steal 10 men's results, then it's research. Do some research, okay? <laughs>